From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. This isn't your father's market. So declared a Forbes article a couple months ago as stock indexes crested to new heights. You can go back and find a similar piece written just about every year from the first financial news coverage in the early 1800s to today. And while nothing happens the same way twice, and there are always new hurdles to cross, unexpected turbulence along the way, the markets have shown a resilience to persevere through the centuries despite an ever-changing world. The article in question focused on investors around my age. Their father's generation entered the workforce when interest rates were about 20% and stock trading was measured in weeks, not microseconds. But even today's youngest investors trading on a custodial account, perhaps with the Robinhood app under the watchful eye of their parents, are operating in a brand new market. The companies coming to market today, the amount of capital, the types of securities that can be bought or sold, and even the technology connecting it together is changing all the time. Here at ICE, we've embraced this pressure and used it to constantly innovate what we do and how we do it. The entire trading ecosystem has been evolving alongside us to meet the demands of the modern financial world. The bulwarks through this period have been the firms that have found the best mixture to combine the know-how of decades of experience with the fearlessness to embrace change and take risk. Continued success requires someone be as resilient as the market itself. Our guest today, Howard Lutnick, has shown that characteristic sometimes in the most challenging of spotlights. As CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald, he transformed one of the street's iconic brokerage shops into a competitive multifaceted financial services firm with clients across the globe. Along the way, he was faced with a tragedy that went beyond anything that being a successful businessman could prepare you for. When Cantor Fitzgerald came to epitomize the horrific events of 9-11 for the financial community, the firm lost two thirds of its New York workforce that day. But in an incredible display of strength, the CEO and its employees brought the firm's trading back online saving the company in the process, and supporting the survivors of those who perished. Our conversation with Howard Lutnick on his career, his perspective on markets, and the role that philanthropy plays in his life. Our conversation with Howard Lutnick is coming up right after this. Historical data can offer insight into the direction of markets. Yet data processing, collection, and storage can be challenging and costly. To simplify your data access needs and help find efficiencies, we launched ICE Data Vault, a cloud-based platform that enables you to access tick history for global exchanges, as well as our proprietary data, sourced from our real-time feed. Backtest your trading strategies to assess performance and viability, conduct transaction cost analysis, and support compliance requirements. Input data into surveillance systems to help detect and prevent abusive or illegal trading activities. Access over 10 years of deep tick history across asset classes. Get tick data for an entire market or on an underlying list of instruments. Access additional securities as needed. With flexible delivery options to complement your workflow. Simplify your historical data management with ICE Data Vault. Our guest today, Howard Lutnick, is chairman and CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald, one of the world's leading financial services firms, as well as chairman and CEO of BGC Partners, a leading global brokerage and financial technology company. Welcome, Howard, inside the Ice House. Nice to see you. 
So, Howard, in 1945, Bernard G. Cantor created a bond brokerage firm, joined 10 years later by John Fitzgerald, that would serve Wall Street's fixed-income interdealer community. Can you tell us a little bit about the mission of these two founders and what they set out to accomplish? So the International Herald Tribune had an article in 1945 that Bernie Cantor put a quote in, and he said he planned to use the technology that uh, was really developed during World War II and bring that technology to Wall Street. So that was his mission in 1945, which is amazing because if you think about the way the company has evolved and his role in it, he really did uh, keep to that mission, you know, continuously evolving, using technology to fundamentally change the way business was done. And, uh, you know, we tried to keep that birthright going. What was some of that technology coming out of World War II? So what Bernie Cantor did is he uh, he had his company lay cable throughout New York. And uh, Intel uh, at the time wasn't making chips. It was making tubes. And so they installed in uh, their clients cables and tubes, and they had a two-dimensional screen. And that was really exciting and was called the speed screen because you could actually see the quotation and not just have to listen to it on the phone. You know, before that, there were ticker tapes and people would yell it out loud. And and Bernie Kanner came up with this two-dimensional screen and created something called screen brokerage. And now you're thinking, oh, that's silly. But, you know, you remember all these things start somewhere. And actually, screen brokerage started in the world of fixed income in Bernie Cantor's mind. I mean, in those early days, Cantor Fitzgerald was known for the indispensable advice it offered to institutional investors and even really those in the Hollywood community. The company became a key player in the bond market. It's been a long time since Cantor and Fitzgerald teamed up as World War II was coming to an end. Paint a picture for us of the firm and its customers today, now 70 years on. I guess the best way to think about it is it's the biggest little guy in the financial service market. You know, there's the JP Morgan and Citigroup and Goldman Sachs. They're sort of the giant players who uh, seek to be everything to everyone. And then you have Cantor Fitzgerald who believes in a very particular motto, which is A or N-A. Be the greatest in the world or you just don't do it. And so you'll see our franchises are extraordinary in the things that we do, but we don't try to do everything to everyone. So Cantor Fitzgerald trades the best place to trade blocks of stock. And you say, what, is, what does that mean? Well, if you want to sell 100 shares, you sell it electronically. But what if you really wanted to sell two and a half million shares of a company stock that only trades 100,000 shares a day? You need someone to protect you. You can't just put on the New York Stock Exchange's floor. You know, I have two and a half million shares for sale because then the stock will go down. So lots of people chop them up and put them in uh, algos and machines. But what if you wanted to sell it now? And that's when you'd call Cantor Fitzgerald and, and use your trusted advisor to find the other side of that transaction. And since everybody uses Cantor to do that, it's a fun way to sell blocks of stock fun way to sell blocks of bonds, fun meaning you get the benefit of the bargain. Everybody's on your side, but everybody's on the buyer's side too. You're going to get a fair price in the middle. That's basically the way you're going to think about it. And so we do that in stocks. We do that in bonds. We have a great healthcare franchise because we help not the world's largest biotech companies and biopharma companies, but the ones that are the small on the smaller side, let's say less than $5 billion in value. That's where we live and breathe, and uh, and we're the you know we're great at that. We're great at SPACs. Uh, we've been the best in SPACs since, since 2015, when most people had never heard of SPACs. Now, you read in the paper every day about SPACs, but we were number one in SPACs in 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19. But we're, what are we not the best at? We're not the best at SPACs that raise $2 billion or $4 billion and, and hunt for companies that are $20 billion. You know, that's, that, again, that's for the big banks. Where do we live and breathe? $750 million and less. We're, we're the best in the world by a wide, wide margin, as, as we've always been. We do this thing called at-the-money offering, where we're the best in the world. And, and these are the kind of things that we do. And you'd say, well, what is that? Do you remember Tesla a couple of weeks ago? 
raised money using an electronic system to sell. And what they do is, if you think about it, instead of a company announcing they want to do a secondary and raise an enormous amount of money, uh, and then say, I want to raise $5 billion. And so if Tesla said, I want to raise $5 billion, this stock would go down 3 to 5%. Instead, what they do is they sell 100 shares, just a penny cheap, and some machine gobbles it up. And they do that with computers all day, every day. And within a couple of days, they've sold $5 billion and it cost them a couple of cents. So Canada Fitzgerald has been the dominant player in that space for as long as you can recall. So you seem to be there before everybody else. And the answer is, we're a $3 billion company on Wall Street. And JP Morgan's $250 billion. <laughs> so we pick our spots. We're really smart, really focused, extraordinary distribution value to clients. But we pick our spots. Talking about picking your spots, Howard, if I've got my history right, you picked your spot joining the company right out of Haverford College. And as a guy who's got a brother who went to Haverford and me coming from Swarthmore, Wall Street didn't have a direct path to the Quaker Triangle. What lured you to the world of finance? So for people who don't know these schools, Haverford and Swarthmore are the best small schools in the country, you know, but really small. I mean, Haverford's probably the size of most people's high school, right? We grad I graduated with 300 people and they're, they're like, wow, 300 people graduating. I mean, that's like a dorm where my kids go to school. You know what I mean? That's not, it's not the same. So I went to Haverford College because my father was a professor of history and uh, I was a tennis player, a division three tennis player, which means I was really good in my country club, but let's not overdo it. Yeah. You know, I wasn't wearing tennis clothes when I graduated college. That was not going to happen. But, you know, I was ranked in, let's call it in the 40s on, in New York, New Jersey and Connecticut. You know, solid for D3, but there's always someone out there who's going to kick my butt. And um, Haverford wrote me a note uh, because I had good, really good grades and I, and I was a reasonably good tennis player for D3. And, and they recruited me to a teeny school in Pennsylvania. So, of course, I threw out the letter because why would I do that? And then um, I would string my own tennis rackets at the time uh, because it was economically much cheaper to do. Buy your own strings and string your own rackets. And so I, I needed a note to remind myself to string my rackets. So I went in the garbage can. I took out this letter. I wrote on the back of it, string your racket. And then my father came home and he saw this Eck crew, you know, that sort of yellowish, fancy stationery that said string your racket. He turned it over. He saw it was a recruiting letter from Haverford College. And that's how I went to Haverford College. My father knew what Haverford was. And I said to my dad, well, who's ever heard of Haverford College? And my father said, a professor of history says, people who know, yeah. know Haverford. And that's, so that's how I end up at uh, small Haverford College. Where was your dad a prof? Queens College, City University of New York, American history, colonial American history. You know, he wrote a book on how the British press, right? Talk about fake news, right? How the British press reported on the American Revolution. Basically, they're winning the war until they lose. <laughs> so he's at Queens College. You're down in singles and doubles in the Middle Atlantic Conference. And you, you got the world in front of you, Howard. What brings you back to Wall Street, basically, out of a place where, frankly, you know, Swarthmore, Haverford, Bryn Mawr, they're not sending a lot of people to Wall Street. So... I lost my mom in 11th grade to uh, Long Island breast cancer. And there was like a sort of a heat map of that. It must be something in the water. There was something, but it was one of the great heat maps of America for that kind of cancer. And my father was diagnosed with cancer the summer just before I went to Haverford, but he didn't tell me he was diagnosed with cancer. I went to Haverford and one week later, my father started his, uh, his chemotherapy treatment. He went to Syosset Hospital on Long Island and uh, got his first uh, dose of chemotherapy and the nurse made a mistake and gave him a hundred times a dose and killed him. And so I was at Haverford for a week. And when you lose one parent, it's one thing, but when you lose the second parent, it's just a whole nother thing. My extended family, you know, sadly, they, they pulled out. You know, I, I couldn't imagine that as I sit here today, because if something happened to, uh, to one of my family members, my sister or my brother, I mean, you'd want to own their family, like in a way, but 
they were just afraid we'd be sticky. You know, here you have my brother's 15, I'm 18, my sister's 20. And, and my uncle at the time says, uh, you know, at my father's funeral, which was September 15th, by the way, he was killed September 12th. So not a good time of year for me generally. You know, it's, yes. It's a good time. Stick away from me. But, you know, at my father's funeral on September 15th, they asked me what I was doing for Thanksgiving. And I said, well, isn't, isn't that like in November? I got, why aren't you worried about how I'm going to eat tonight? And he's like, no, I just want to know if you want to come over for Thanksgiving. And we never really spoke after that. So it was really me, my sister, and my brother. And so what ended up happening is my, uh, we put my brother in boarding school right near Haverford in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And then he would stay with me on the weekends. And then the next year, my sister graduated college and he moved up with her. She went to Syracuse Law School. And business school, she got an MBA, JD, an underperformer, my sister. It's one of those things that happened. And um, he uh, he moved in with her and finished. Uh, he went to his last year of public school in, in Syracuse. So what, what happened at Haverford to me was, so I dropped out. I dropped out of Haverford. I wrote him a letter saying, you know, I can't come back. I'm going to take care of my, uh, my brother. And they called me about three weeks later and said, uh, now, remember, I'd only been there a week. They said, uh, no, 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 we don't want you to drop out. Uh, come back and uh, we will find a way for it to pay for your education. Just come back. And I decided to go live the life that my father wanted me to have. So I went back to school. And so I love Haverford College because they, they were actually, strangely, they were the family that stepped up for me then. And so if you, if you go to Haverford College, which your family will do, or Bryn Mawr, which is uh, right next door, you'll see the reason that uh, there are so many things there that I've supported uh, is because they deserve the support from me because they earned it uh, when I was a freshman for a week. And the way I describe it is they weren't saying, oh, this guy, Howard, he's going to be great. I mean, with all due respect, if you knew me as a freshman for a week, you wouldn't have thought I was going to be so great. But it was about them that they were the kind of people who stepped up when someone needed it. And so I think they deserve my gratitude decades and decades later. Yeah. And so here I was, you know, a senior at Haverford with really no, you know, no connections, no anything. And, uh, and a great family friend said, you should meet Bernie Kent. And he invited me over his house and he introduced me to Bernie Care. And at the end of that meal, uh, which was a very stressful meal, not, not because of the reasons you think, it's because my friends serve spaghetti. And I'm like a senior, and I'm wearing like a white shirt and stuff, and I'm Bad trying news. to eat spaghetti. And there's no chance it's not getting all over me. And it was like the most stressful meal because I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to definitely spill this all over myself, and I'm going to look like a fool. But uh, I ended up with a clean shirt, which was the reason for my stress. And ultimately got a job at, uh, at Canna Fitzgerald. And so I've never had another job. So this is yeah. my first and only job. A family friend introduced me to Bernie Cantor. That's how I went to Wall Street. So seven years out of Haverford, I think if I've got my math right, at the age of 29, you were appointed chief operating officer of Cantor. And by the next year, president. You know, it's the end of the George H.W. Bush years, the beginning of the Clinton era. What was New York like and how did you see the opportunity to affect change as the economy under the Bush years was beginning to turn a corner into the 90s? When I look back, you know, I, I entered the workplace in 1983 in, in the greatest moment in time to go, right? Tax rates came smashing down. Uh, the economy came smashing up. And, uh, and it really was a great year. So interest rates were high and they came down, as you said, from... You know, I, I remember 12% short-term rates, you know, but as they came down, you had, you had just tremendous, tremendous growth and tremendous opportunity. And, you know, I rose quickly through the firm, the best way to grow quickly through a firm. I made the boss so much money that he liked me, then he really liked me. And then a couple of years in 1986 and 1988, I made him so much money that it became love. Okay. And that's, you know, if I made you as much money as, as I made him, you'd love me too. I mean, that's, it's not that 
you know, it's not that hard to say. <laughs> so, you know, so someone says, well, how do you become the president of the company when you're 29? And the answer is, if you make the boss enough money, right, that's how you become the president when you're 29. <laughs> I mean, an essential component of Cantor's business model when you were first starting out was its e-speed operations. You mentioned it in earlier part of our conversation, this critical link to treasury markets. It was launched in 1996. It was a revolutionary system that provided the government bond market with this fully electronic trading system. Now, bond markets have been slower to, in their moving to digital, but there's been a lot of progress in the past year, certainly here at the fixed income and data services segment of ICE. Why do you think that the electronification and automation of fixed income markets has lagged in the past? And why is it so crucial for the future? As you said, so you remember Bernie Carey he invented this two-dimensional screen system. And, and one of the things that I drove was the speed system, which was just this screen, this two-dimensional screen becoming e-speed. And that's why I called it that. So you could electronically trade right on it. And what happened is in the bond markets, there are million municipal bonds, you know, every county uh, and corporate bonds, there's hundred thousand. Whereas in stocks, there's about 5,000. Each share of IBM is the same as each other's share of IBM. Whereas each municipal bond, oh my gosh, or in each corporate bond, oh my God, there's tons of them. So Fixed income markets became what I would say they go electronic in a barbell. The most commodity like ones, which we developed electronically first, US Treasuries, right? They issue billions of them, now tens of billions at a clip, right? Of the same bond. So that's something easy to trade. And it trades just like stocks. It's electronically and it trades just like stocks. And then you would think the other thing we came up with is, is a way to electronically trade that which is really illiquid. And think of it like an auction, right? It, it never trades, the stuff never trades. So how do you, how do they auction like a piece of art that never trades, right? The, the person puts the art up for sale, some famous piece of art, and then the auction house publishes it and tries to create a whole drumbeat of interest and gets everybody to pay attention like at 8.30 on Tuesday night. But otherwise it could never trade. You know, it's a pain in the tail to trade it. So that's what we did. We created these matching systems. And so the less liquid ones, we would, we would make a big thing, say, this is going to trade this day, this is going to trade this day, this is going to trade this way. And so we ended up having a barbell, the most liquid electronic and the most illiquid, and that was electronic. You, know, you can only participate in these auctions because, gosh, there are so many of them electronically. And in between, what you had was professionals who you could talk to and say, hey, find me something like this. And if they couldn't find the IBM bond, maybe they found you the Ford bond. Maybe, you know, they, you found Coca-Cola. You know, I mean, you know, what are you looking for? You're looking for consumer. You're looking for auto, you, you know, and and there are so many things that are similar. That in, in the world of credit, a person could help you. And now you fast forward to today. More and more are going to be on computers. Why? Because we know that computers can do more and more of these things. You know, 15 years ago, not so much. So it wasn't really that they were slow to evolve. It was that computers were not capable of that type of analysis. And you would say, yeah, but now they are. And the answer is, oh, I totally agree with you. In 2004, you made this big decision to separate the voice brokerage business from Cantor Fitzgerald and form BGC Partners. Walk us through your thinking at the time and why you thought it was important to refocus these different businesses. Well, and, and I'm sure we'll get to it, but the events of 9-11 sort of changed the outcome of the company. So basically, Cantor Fitzgerald had in it two big businesses. It had taking care of institutions. And, and the big stock block trading and, and big bond trading, right? We had that business. And, and we also had the world's largest wholesale financial service business. So basically, when JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or Bank of America, all the names, you know, you think about an individual investor gives Fidelity money. Fidelity wakes up in the morning, wants to buy or sell something. They call like a big bank. Who's the big bank call? They must call somebody. They don't have, you know, the, remember that the person who works at Goldman Sachs was sleeping, holding his pillow, woke up in the morning, went to work and Fidelity said, I'd like to buy X, Y, Z. What does that person do? 
They call the wholesaler. And that's where we are. We, so at the time of 9-11, we were the world's largest wholesaler. And we had Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. I mean, every single one of them on speed dial where everywhere. People would ask me what I did for a living. And I said, in the wholesale market, I follow JP Morgan like a puppy. Like whatever they want to do, we follow them and we take care. We're with them. We're the best friend. But but they are, they decide what to buy and sell. And we help them find it with who? With Deutsche Bank and Nomura and, you know, and Sockchen. We connect all the banks in the world to each other. And, and that's the wholesale market. And, and so after 9-11, I had these two businesses, but the problem was the company had been shattered. You know, we were located on the top of the World Trade Center and the company had been shattered. And so, whereas before we were a happy boardroom of partners because we were a partnership and I'd come in and say, okay, where should we invest next? And since we all owned each other, it was sort of friendly. Yeah. But now when they destroy your house and they destroy your best friend's neighbor's house and I walk in, with enough money to buy one house, it's war. Because it's not about congeniality anymore. It's about survival. And so I had to split the companies up. Now, Cantor Fitzgerald was such a successful company before 9-11 that we had no debt. None. We didn't have any rated, like we weren't rated. Why? We had no debt. You know, when you're a successful company and you make a lot of money, you actually don't need to borrow money from somebody if you're in our business. Because remember, we're not big bettors on Wall Street. They're big banks make big bets. We don't make big bets. We help other clients do what they need to do. And so what ended up happening is I needed to separate the two. And for the first time in my professional life, I borrowed money on every single thing that I owned. Words, my house, everything I did and borrowed a huge amount of money and split the company in two. Took all the money in Cannon Fitzgerald, put it in one, and separated BGC, which is basically Bernie Cantor's initials, and, and created a wholesale financial service company and put the, all the borrowed money in that. And then I had to separate the two because it was a survival between the two companies. And that way they could thrive. And I had debt for the first time in my professional life. But it's what I needed to do to have these companies survive and thrive. The current state of market data, and we'll get into Phoenix later if we have time, but it was shaped by everything that you're talking about, changes to market structure and technology following the events of 9-11. Howard, I know you've shared this story many times, but maybe if there's a different angle on it, tell us about your experience on that day and how or if your perspective on it has changed now over 20 years. Well, so, you know, just from for quick background, you know, I have four children. I was taking my oldest son to his first day of kindergarten. That's why I wasn't in the building. But er every person who worked for me who was in the building uh, was killed that day. My brother, Gary, uh, was there. He was 36. My best friend, Doug, 39. The World Trade Center bombing of 1993 taught us that life is short. And so we made the rule at the firm. It's, it's not a common rule, but that we want to work with people that we like. And so we encouraged everybody to hire people that they like. And I would describe it this way. I'd say, we all have the same rainbow of friends. Now think of your friends. The ones on the left, smart, capable, rock star winners. You got those friends? Now the ones on the right, they make you laugh at a bar, hard, because they're fantastic. We have the same friends? Let's just hire the ones on the left, okay? We'll just stick to the ones on the left. And that was the company. So we all had our friends, everybody. And then on 9-11, we lost, as you said, two thirds of our staff. And that means we all lost our best friends, my college roommate's brother, my other best friend's brother-in-law. You know, I couldn't go to some of my friends' funerals because there were two of them on the same minute. I mean, there were, we lost 658 people. You got to realize that's, that's 20 funerals a day, every day for 35 straight days. It is pulverizing pulverize. And so we still, you know, we, we embrace that model. We still only want to work with people that we like. That's, I think, the reason that we survive. I think it's the reason that the people who lived through the horrible events of September 11th and worked for Cannabis Gerald wanted to commit to come back to work, not to come back to work, 
but we gave 25% of everything we made to the families of those we lost. And now that you know that they were my friends, not only my friends, but everybody in the company had their friends. They all did it to take care of their friends' families. And the way we did it was, let's say we were going to hire you for $150,000. I'd say, gee, I, I, I can't pay $150,000, but I'll tell you what, we'll pay you uh, $112,500, 25% off, and I'm going to take that $37,500 and I'm going to send it to the families. Now, if you take the job, you're committed, right? Because for five years, you're going to send them your money, effectively. And that happened for everybody in the company. And then when we took BGC public in April of 08, and you say, April of 08, who takes a company public in April of 08? Could it have been any worse? And the answer was, if you go look at that IPO, it's the strangest IPO you've ever seen. Because there's six pages, single spaced of selling shareholders. And what that was is each one of those employees who committed and gave that money to the families, I kept track of. And in five years, by the way, your salary went all the way back up to what it should have been, right? So now maybe you would have been making 200 grand. Okay, fine. I kept track of every penny of that. And when we took BGC public, I gave each, I gave two things. I gave you that amount of shares and at the IPO, only you sold, not the company. And you got that amount of cash. So let's say in this case, you would have given $200,000 with your raises over those five years. You received on the IPO $200,000 in cash and $200,000 in stock. And BGC came taken out of my share because the reason I was able to live my life was because my employees who joined us and rebuilt this company, gave their soul. I remember clearly your appearances on live network television in the aftermath of the attack. Your, your sense of loss was on full display. It's indelible in my head. After 9-11, there were a lot of people processing what had happened to their lives and their families and their jobs. You just talked about it. How do you think it affected and shaped the kind of leader that you are today, 20 years later? So... When I, when I think back to September 10th, we had no debt. We had a, you know, a totally winning company. And I didn't really want to be partners with it. Why? We're, we're doing great. We're making plenty of money. And a- after 9-11, I just needed other people's help. And so I wanted to be partners with lots of people. And I think what's happened is my, my perspective on no matter how successful you become, having more partners and more friends and more people you do business with would be better. And so I've become much more interested in working with others and more able to create partnerships and interesting alignments and, uh, and doing business together. And, and that's simply a lesson I probably, you probably couldn't have taught me. The the other lesson I I learned uh, long ago in 93, really, I learned the other lesson is uh, disaster. Most people's disaster recovery plans are a disaster. <laughs> it just, you know, you can't because you, you imagine what you think the disaster is, but then you, you, you can't imagine. And, there, you know, there was, you know, what we did, we, we had our backup computer center in New Jersey, right? But we never thought that all the people who would operate it would be gone. So I had to find people, you know, Microsoft and and Cisco flew in people for me to operate my system, just to operate my system. And you know what we did for the first 72 hours? We broke into our own systems. We didn't have any passwords. So, you know, it just, you, you can't plan out for things like that. You just, you know, we survived because we wanted to take care of our friends' families. We had had the kind of businesses that you could back up. And that did back up. And then we hired lots of people who committed more than work. They committed their souls at 25% to the families. And, and that bound them together in a way that you couldn't find a new employee today. You know, I can't just hire someone and say, hey, do you want to be part of my culture? And it was amazing. And I'm really, I'm, I'm proud of, you know, BGC Partners and Canada Fitzgerald because the people, they, they were just extraordinary. And, and, and uncommon. 
Speaking of disaster recovery plans, you know, every company of a certain size, ours included, you know, had, had a pandemic response plan, probably gathering dust somewhere, not war gamed out all that often. What parallels, if any, do you see in the resilience of the financial markets and their legion of workers in the last 14 months that we've all been enduring during the COVID pandemic to what you were experiencing 20 years ago? I was shocked by how extraordinary people performed. You know, I, I knew we were well prepared. You know, we had to be backed up. We had to be this. We had to be that. We're, you know, we're crazy that way because think of what's happened to us. And it happened in 93 and it happened in, in 2001. But, you know, the way the market in general performed, the way people were able to get back online and operate was, was amazing. You know, and the markets and America should be, and really the world should be proud of what they were able to accomplish. I mean, if you said the world has to go home on Tuesday, go. I mean, you'd think the thing would just fall over. And not only didn't it fall over, it, it was all right. I mean, yes, it tortured, you know, restaurants and all sorts of people just got crushed by the fact that the normal people who would come and, and do business with them were gone which is horrible. And, I, and, and even today when in New York City, you know, the, the lack of commuters is just torturing, yeah. you know, hundreds of businesses. And it's, it's sad, but, you know, but the impressive way that the markets operated and you operate, the way ICE operated, the New York Stock Exchange operated. I mean, these are, these are amazing things that people should be, you know, incredibly proud. You hear how proud I am of the way we dealt with 9-11, but I am, I am fundamentally amazed at how the American and the global financial system operated and the regulators and our politicians who take it for granted, they should not. It was heroic. It was amazing. And it should make us really proud of the financial markets in general. Thank you for sharing all that. We'll take a quick break. And after that, Howard Lutnick and I will dive deeper into Howard's view of the SPAC world. He mentioned it a little bit earlier. We'll get into that in much more depth, his outlook for the markets and the role of philanthropy. And that's all coming up right after this. Whether it's markets, exchanges, or networks, connection makes everything possible. The connection between data and technology, innovation and expertise, and most of all, between people and opportunity. For over 20 years, ICE has transformed markets, products, and processes to make things work better, faster, smarter. From modernizing energy and commodity trading to revolutionizing the bond markets. Whether it's the world's largest stock exchange, or the dream of home ownership. We do more than see the big picture. We create it. You may not know our name, but we bet you know our network. ICE. Make the connection. Welcome back. Before the break, Howard Lutnick, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Cantor Fitzgerald and the Chairman and CEO of BGC Partners Financial Group, and I were discussing his background, the history of the firm, and the effects on the firm from 9-11, now 20 years ago. I want to switch gears now, Howard, and talk about SPACs. You mentioned it in the beginning of our conversation. By the end of March of this year, SPACs had already raised more than $90 billion in 2021 alone, and it's continued to grow, albeit at a slower clip. They've attracted a lot of serious players along with a crop of celebrities, but it's been all business, as you mentioned earlier, Cantor Fitzgerald. You've been a top underwriter of SPACs for a long time. In a recent interview, you shared that you closed more SPAC deals in 2020 than any other bank, and you continue to invest in your SPAC franchise. What's driving the strategy today, given what we are seeing in, in terms of the current trends over the last, call it six months? Well, SPACs are really, they're an incredible uh, structure. So you take a company public as a SPAC, and that company, the investors, have a right to get their money back at $10. They have an absolute right to get their money back at $10 if they don't like your deal. And you, as the SPAC sponsor's job, is go find a good deal. 
something that's going to be worth more after you buy it. Otherwise, all the investors are going to say, I want my money back. Right. So if you bought something that was worth, you know, a hundred and you paid 150 for it, you know, everyone's going to say, I don't want that. I'll get my money back. Whereas if you bought something that was worth a hundred and you paid 80, uh, they would want it. So that's the challenge. As a sponsor, can you find things that the market thinks are worth more than what you paid? And that's your job. Okay. Who's done that always? Private equity. Right? Private equity invests in stuff that they think, I'm buying it today because I think it's worth more. So what SPACs are, is they are a public wrapper to that which private equity has done for decades, and that private equity investors have made a fortune on for years and years and years. And as you know, we at Cannon Fitzgerald, we only do SPACs we have something called a pipe, which means we won't bring a company public unless big institutional investors have agreed that they'll put in money so that you know the market, it's, it's not a question of whether they will, they already have, right? They've committed to buy it. And, and of course, we all know the idea is for it to go up, but sometimes they can go down. But the idea, of course, is to do it in unison from the IPO market of the SPAC and big institutional investors who back it. And that combination is why SPACs are here to stay. Here at the NYSC, we've seen some sponsors take a step back from SPACs as they, they digest the SEC's new guidance on them, the treatment of warrants and the like. But we're also seeing a continued stream of new SPACs come to market. Was the reset necessary? And what do you think the go forward trend is going to be for SPACs over the coming months and years? Well, there were, there were some technical changes that the SEC said, gee, there's a, a slight technical change and uh, please change that. And, and it took the market six weeks to digest that, but that, that didn't change really anything. What had happened in the SPAC market is lots of the companies were go-go companies, EV companies, battery companies. You know, and, the, and these companies basically said, we're going to change the world in 2024, okay? But not as much 2021, 2022. And we're all used to IPOs where companies are really good and they're making money today and they'll make some more money tomorrow and more money the next day. Um, but, you know, we all know that Amazon did make money for a long time and then killed it. And, you know, and, and the big, there are so many big companies that have done incredibly well, Airbnb and Facebook. So I think there's a lot of excitement about the changing world. And the, and the pandemic, I think, embraced the changing world. But the fact is, these, these companies have raised enough money to change the world. And now they're like private equity companies, meaning whether their stock's trading at 9 or 10 or 11 today, that company raised enough money to go build its product. And let's see how they do in 2023 and 2024. So I think it's pretty exciting. Um, but I think SPACs are here to stay. I think you'll see a pendulum of Sometimes you'll see more profitable companies, more like IPO, they're like a little earlier than an IPO, but IPO like. And sometimes you'll see these go-go companies, and it just it's the mood of the market, like everything else. The market is it's the mood of the market, mm. but basically, it's a cool way of investing. And when the press writes about it, they forget to write about. I mean, really, why would you raise a hundred billion dollars in a quarter, unless it's awesome? You could say, well, it's not as awesome as you said. <laughs> okay, I'm sure it's not as awesome as you said, but the fact is, it's an incredible financial tool. And that's why the world raised $100 billion doing it in the first quarter of this year. So yeah. the fact, should there be a little pause now? You know, I mean, you did raise $100 billion last quarter. You think you could maybe have a little slower the second quarter. I, I don't know, seems sort of obvious to me, but you know, I wish it continued. I got to tell you, I wish we did another hundred billion since last I checked, Cannon Fitzgerald is still uh, third in the world. And, and I just want to point out when Cannon Fitzgerald, who's the, the biggest little guy, right, is in front of Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Deutsche Bank, you know what that means? It's really good for Cannon Fitzgerald. 
really good. For, I mean, another thing that should be really good for Canada Fitzgerald, you mentioned it before the break, healthcare sector. It's a key area of focus for Canner. And in the past, you've brought together leaders from private and public companies to talk about the developments and trends shaping biotech, pharmaceuticals, life sciences, diagnostics, medical technology. Can you talk about how this practice has emerged and highlight some of the recent successes that you've seen that, to your view, are going to be really good for Canada Fitzgerald? So what's America great at? You know, America is great at inventing and defining new ways of doing things. In drugs, we are at the absolute pinnacle. I mean, where America is best is in bio, pharma, and biotech, right? That's why the vaccines, where did the vaccines come from, right? They came from here. Why? Because we were the ones working on our, right, RNA. And, and you know, so, you know, our focus was on, let's go pick companies that are going to do great things and help raise them capital. And I tell you, my, our conference that we have every year, I, I don't know that there's a day that I feel better than having come from that conference because I go from meeting to meeting and, and, you know, I'm like just, you know, I'm just there to shake hands and say hello, you know, and I'd call myself a pretty face, but it wouldn't really work out. So <laughs> I just say, but to listen to these companies and, and what they're raising money to do and, how, and the diseases they're attacking. A friend of mine I went to Haverford with, he, he sets out and he, and he sells his biotech company and then he sets back up and he says, I'm going to go attack sickle cell anemia. I don't think it gets the right amount of money. So we raise the money and then we raise the more money. We keep doing it. And now it's a three, four billion dollar company called Global Blood. It's on the track to solve sickle cell anemia. And that's amazing. So these are it's uplifting. But what we do is we're there early in early stage companies. We help we help raise them capital and hope they become great, gigantic companies that change the planet and, and change our lives by helping someone we love have a more successful, healthy life. Given these things that you and I have been talking about, the opportunities that you see, what do you think is the greatest opportunity for investors right now? What are you most excited about that you see happening in the markets? I think you've got really, really easy monetary policy. And after they tighten, it will be the easiest monetary policy of my life. I mean, it's so easy, like quantitative easing, right? The idea that the government buys its own debt. I mean, what does that even mean? How could that even be on the menu? How, like the US Treasury is running a deficit, so it's going to issue 10 year bonds, and the Fed is going to buy the 10 year bonds and print the money to buy it. And you could scratch, I have no hair, so I can't scratch off my hair. But if I did scratch it, I'd say, what does that even mean? So that's such easy monetary policy that that has to drive economic growth. It has to drive economic growth. So people wonder why is the stock market up so high? Just remember, interest rates are virtually nothing. And if they get to 1%, you know what that is? That's virtually nothing. <laughs> so easy monetary policy. And then you have this stimulus at numbers that I cannot comprehend. I don't know what 1.9 trillion of spending extra means. I can't say I really understand because it's so big. And now it's already happened twice. And then the current president says he's going to do it again. And I don't know what 3 trillion or 2 trillion or an extra trillion and a half. I mean, this is so much stimulus into the world's easiest monetary policy that basically when people worry about, is this party going to end? How could we be up here this high with the pandemic? And the answer is, oh, it's going to continue because the government hasn't even printed the two trillion that President Biden wants to bring out. And if he negotiates it down to 1.5 trillion, some people will be disappointed. And I will still be amazed that the number was 1.5 trillion because before a year and a half ago, I never heard such a thing. My whole life, we'd never heard such a thing. And now we hear it like we're already numb to it because it's ah, the third time we spent more than a trillion. Wow. So I think the opportunity, the market's here to change things. It wants people, it's moving the internet 10 years forward quicker. We do Zoom casually and we all learn to do Zoom 
on the same Tuesday. Yeah. Everybody used team teams for Microsoft on the same Wednesday. It's like, it's unbelievable. So people know they can do things working from home. They know they can do things without traveling, right? There's never going to be another road show the way we used to do it, right? We used to get an executive on the, on the plane and we fly them around and we drive them around in cars. Why? They could sit in one chair and see everybody more efficiently and everybody's happier. Like everybody's happy. So I think there's lots of wind in the sails and people have been cooped up for a year and they want to get out and travel. They want to drive their car. They want to go stay in a hotel. They want to go out to dinner. They want to buy clothes. And that fun is going to drive economic activity for the future. So if you think about it this way, the last time there was a pandemic, it was 1918. And we had the roaring 20s. I think you're feeling the beginning of the roaring 20s. Talking about what the roaring 20s will be and the things that people have been doing at home, Howard, over the past couple of months, we've seen the rise and influence of retail investors grow more than 10 million new brokerage accounts set up in the last year, a new record. In an interview in February, you spoke about how it's important for the market participants to watch retail investors, learn what's driving them. Can you tell us a little bit about this trend and why it's one people should be paying a lot more attention to? Retail investors love Tesla. Retail investors love Bitcoin. Retail investors love Amazon. Which day is this new? Right? What all that happened is GameStop was really they're buying GameStop? But the answer was really they're buying Bitcoin? Bit, what does Bitcoin have? Nothing. And now Bitcoin's going to have a, a sentence on your tax return that says, Did you buy Bitcoin? Hey, it's taxable, and then people are going to say, holy moly, I, I thought this was getting around that. The answer is the retail investors have better access now than ever before, better transparency than ever before, okay? Better access and better transparency means they can make their own decisions. And the fact that millions and millions are making their own decisions, and millions and millions of young people are, are investing the way they think the future is going to be, it's pretty amazingly exciting, which you, ICE and the New York Stock Exchange provide. So, you know, you and, and, and NASDAQ do such a great job, it, it's going to unleash value. And that's what you've done. As we wrap up this amazing conversation, one of your philanthropic legacies is the Cantor Fitzgerald Relief Fund which was created in the wake of 9-11 and your annual Global Charity Day where Cantor and BGC commemorate those that you lost by distributing revenues from the fund to charities across the world. In the past, you've been joined by the likes of President Clinton, President Bush, so many others. As we approach the 20th anniversary of the horrific event that all of us in lower Manhattan share a connection to, how is Global Charity Day going to be marked this year and where does remembrance go from here? So, you know, right after, right after September 11th, you know, I had this gigantic, you know, gigantic issues, right? I had to rebuild the company, but I needed, I needed to touch the families. And so I, I, uh, I asked my sister to, uh, who, who had just lost her brother. And remember, we lost our, our parents when we were young. So the loss of my brother, because I only have a brother and a sister, and to lose my brother was just uh, as crushing as could ever be to take care of the families to create the Canada Fitzgerald Relief Fund and to take care of the families. And, and that's what Edie did sort of heroically for the first five years. And that's when we gave 25% of everything we did, but someone had to touch them. Someone had to be the human being. You're not just sending checks in the mail. That's, that's trash. You have to be there. You have to love them. You have to care. And, and my sister did that brilliantly. And then after five years, what we did is we decided together with my wife, Allison, we would morph the relief fund to take care of those who had crises. And those crises were Hurricane Sandy, right? Ripping through here. And we picked 19 elementary schools that, you know, suffer in ordinary times, let alone being in, in the wake of such a horrible event. And we went and, um, and we called the schools 
and the principals, uh, we just told them every kid in the elementary school, invite their parents to come in. And we gave them $1,000 each. Just gave them $1,000. Don't be their parent. Don't tell them what to do. Just give them money and, and let them decide what's best for their family. And then we did that at uh, Hurricane Harvey. And we went down to Puerto Rico and went to Moore, Oklahoma. And so what happens is we are people with a broken heart. And so we, we come with hundreds of volunteers. We fly down, you know, we get uh, one of the airlines gives a jet blue has often donated a plane to us. And we fly down hundreds of volunteers and we take over a Coliseum and we just give away a thousand dollars to kids in elementary schools that have been pulverized by an attack. And on our charity day, which we do on September 11th, or the business day that's closest to it, um, we ask all our employees to waive their compensation for the day. And we ask our clients to come in and just do as much business as they can. And we don't give away our profits. We give away every single penny of revenue. And that has tended to be around 11 or $12 million a year. And then we seek to give that money away the way we just described not with any forms or any applications. Just if you were harmed by the hurricane and you have a kid in this elementary school, here's a thousand dollars. Someone in New York who you don't know, who's never coming back later and asking for anything. Just want you to know we care about you. We understand and feel your pain. Over those 20 years, I think somewhere around $347 million given away globally. Howard, even in the wake of disaster and the enduring memory of it, there's always been a reminder that people do carry on, that there's work to be done, that opportunities are ever present. Curious, what's next for Cantor Fitzgerald, BGC Partners, and you? Well, my uh, my companies are are very much my children. They have their destiny, and and my job is to help them reach that destiny. And uh, I have great people who work here, and and I love the people who work here. They are my great friends and I have such incredible respect for them. And uh, they have exciting times ahead of them. I'm just excited to work with the people I do. I always have new people joining and young people joining, trainees coming. And it's just, you know, I'm addicted to people who are who are excited and driving forward. And uh, and I love working. So uh, and, my, and my wife, she she married me when I was already like this. So she's not suffering. She she knew, you know, Monday through, uh, you know, Monday through Friday, you know, you weren't going to see me at home. But the weekends, you know, whatever she wants to do, I do. I got to I got to when the days when we used to go to department stores, when that was like a thing, I would go to the department store with her on Saturday because uh, and I would be the only guy in there walking with his head high, not dragging uh, because, look, she doesn't see me during the week. So she should see me on the weekend. And uh, I would do what she wanted. And that was okay. That's sort of my balance in a marriage. And it's worked for me and her. So we've been married 26 years and uh, four great kids. And uh, I'm happy. Well, from 1983 to 2021, not bad for a Division Three tennis player from Haverford. <laughs> Even said from a Swarthmore guy. <laughs> Thanks so much, Howard, for joining us inside the Ice House. Thanks. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Howard Ludnick. Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Cantor Fitzgerald and Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of BGC Partners. If you like what you heard, please rate us on our iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Stefan Capriel with production assistance from Pete Ash, Ken Abel, and Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host signing off from the library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 